Good morning. Is this on? I'm on. Okay. Right. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord. For I have brought you this far not to leave you out, but to take you in. Do not doubt that what I have started, I will complete and finish. And I will be everything in between. I will not leave you out, but I will take you in. And Father, we pray this morning. that your Holy Spirit will take it and apply it to our lives. Amen. You said, Lord, that we'd know the truth and the truth would set us free. Amen. Help us to embrace what is truth for each one of us today so we may walk in a greater freedom with you Amen. to reveal more of you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, good morning, everybody. Did I already say that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's in the mouths of two or three witnesses, that's what it is. Um, okay, we're looking at... Um, well, I'm eventually going to get round to studying the book of Philippians. Um, but I wanted to look at how the church was planted, and we've been doing that over the last two or three months. Um, so, in Acts 16, we've been looking in Acts 16, Paul, on his second missionary journey, along with Silas, Timothy, and... Luke. Luke joins them at Troas and then to Philippi. They have been, we've looked how that they were steered by prayer of these women by the riverside in Philippi, it would appear. And they arrive, well, they're looking for a synagogue, but there's no synagogue because there's not 10 men or Jewish men that uh, are there in Philippi to set one up. So these women are meet, have met by the riverside. They've been praying. Paul and his team turn up, and Paul shares with them, and Lydia in particular, and her household believe and get, uh, get saved, and they are baptized. And so the birthing of this church starts. Um, and I want to just continue to look at how it's completed. Um, the team and these women appear to continue in prayer at that riverside before taking the next step. And I'm not too sure they know what the next step is. Uh, but they spend time in prayer. It's an ongoing thing over many days. And I want to pick the story up at Acts 16:16. 16, 16. If we could have that slide up. 
can't read that. <laughs> okay, I'll read it from here. It happened as we were going to prayer that a certain slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much gain by fortune-telling. She followed us, crying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. You wonder where Luke and Timothy were, don't you? He's probably writing it down behind a rock somewhere. Because <laughs> he's the scribe. Um, and verse 20, And they brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. And we'll stop there. Okay, last time we finished off and we highlighted the power of prayer. And I just want to go back there for a moment. The time of this attack, this, this woman with a spirit of divination or fortune telling, starts to join the group or follow the group, and there's an attack on the work. The attack is when they start to pray. So it shows us again the power that's invested in prayer. We don't, need, we don't underestimate that power. Their prayers stirred up the spiritual dimension around them. And when you start to connect with heaven and listen to what Father is saying and start to pray that, what God has revealed to you, you are going to stir up the spiritual dimension around you. Isn't that exciting? Yes. For some of us it might not be, but for others it might be. Yes, it is exciting. Um, it stirs up the spiritual dimension around us. And there is a spiritual dimension all around us. We don't always see it. We can feel its effect, see its effect, but it's there. And we need to recognize the spiritual dimension around us. We will if we pray this way. And prayer is king, the kingdom key that causes heaven to invade earth. We have been given keys to bring heaven down to earth. Power of prayer. Power of connecting with heaven. And praying what we re get revealed to us. And the enemy is threatened by those who prayerfully walk in God's plan. He's threatened by those who prayerfully walk in God's plan. Listening to how to put that plan, plan into action. The enemy is threatened by that because you carry the presence of God. Yep. And the enemy hates the presence of God. When Jesus turned up in a situation there was, and the demonic was there, it started to manifest itself and get scared and said, go away, we don't want you here. It gets threatened by the presence of Jesus and we bring that presence when we walk prayerfully in God's plan. Yep. It's a threat to darkness. Hallelujah. It's greater than the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome the light. Walking in the light exposes what's hidden in the darkness. Then we need to know what to do with it. And we're going to learn a little bit about that this morning, hopefully. But it exposes the darkness that's at work around us. Okay, this, this slave girl, she's slave to these masters here gain. Is this going on and off? Yes, all the time. All the time. Great. Lord, help us. <laughs> if it goes off more than it stays on, just wave at me and I'll get that thing. I don't like that thing, but I'll use it if I have to. Okay, there's a slave girl. She joins the group. 
there is a spirit in this girl. Whether she's possessed or oppressed, I don't know, but there's a spirit operating through her. And it's revealing knowledge about this team, Paul's team, that's spot on. And the enemy can do that. Reveals knowledge about the team and she's revealing knowledge for her masters, knowledge that has power to gain wealth. And it's called fortune telling. That's what it's described in the scripture there, fortune telling. Occult or fortune telling or whatever you want to include in occult, occult just means that which is hidden. Um, it's not nonsense. I've talked to people and they say, oh, it's just a load of nonsense. No, it's not. And you see here, it's not nonsense. It's a powerful spirit that's operating here to get the master's gain. It's sharing knowledge that's spot on. There is a power that's operating there, um, and it's powerful. Not for good, but it's powerful. When I was working in the States, I spent four four and a half years working in the States in Los Angeles, and there, there was a guy who shared of his experience with a fortune teller. And he said, I went to, he was doing the horses, and he decided to go to the fortune teller to ask what was going to be the winner on the, the race he was going to bet on. And he crossed a palm with silver, and uh, the lady gave him a name of a horse that she didn't know was in the race, but it was. So he put a small amount on this horse and the race, and guess what? It won. And he was very impressed with that, so he went back to her the following week, and again, crossed the palm with silver, she gave him a name, she put, he put the money on the horse, and guess what? A little bit more this time, and it won. And it kept going on, and this went on for a few months. And he got so excited about this, he was so confident this was going to work, he, he, morg he remortgaged his house. Yes. And he went back and put the money on. And guess what? It lost. The occult has a good shop front. People wouldn't go to it if it didn't have a good shop front. It can bring a measure of healing. It can bring wealth. It can bring all sorts of things, but at the end of it, it's got a sting in the tail. It's like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't separate the good from the evil. There's good in it, but it's attached to evil. And that's why God says, run a mile from it. Amen. Don't engage in it. That was one of the things I was engaged in before I was saved. But it's what brought me to the Lord, praise God. But anyway, that's another story. Um, it has a good shot front, be careful. The word that's used here for the spirit of divination is an interesting word. And I want to just bring that out. If you look in the Greek, the word is python. That serpent or python, the snake, whatever you want to call it. It's python, so it's a spirit of python. Interesting. I thought it was anyway. The word python, or this python, where it comes from, is linked to the Greek god Apollo. Um, and Apollo was known by Greek, in Greek mythology, he was known for telling future events, which is interesting. And the two were linked. And I just want to highlight something there. If you worship another god or an idol... You open the door to the demonic into your life. That's what Scripture teaches. The thing that we worship is not a God, uh, uh, you know, a spirit, but a spirit comes behind it to hook you. Okay? So we, that's why God says, have no other gods. Because you're opening the... And people say, why is this happening to me? Well, did you open the door to another God? Even Christians can open a door to another God. They serve other things. When you serve other things, you are straying beyond God's boundary into darkness territory. 
And don't be surprised if it wants to attach and hook you. And it will if you continue down that road. So important to realize these things. Um, and what's behind that other God, its identity can start to manifest in your life. What do I mean by that? Well, let me try and give you an example. What do you think a spirit of fear is going to bring? Fear. If it's a spirit of fear, it's going to bring fear. If it's an unclean spirit, what are you going to feel like? Dirty. And you know, we have ministered to people who have confessed their sins, repented and tried to go, jump through hoops to repent of all sorts of things. And they still come to and said, I don't know why it is, but I still feel unclean. And I feel ashamed. And I don't know why. Why am I feeling this? Because there may be a spirit that's still attached there and hooked in that needs to be released from you. And so that you don't live, because that's always going to tell you you're dirty when you're not. It's going to lie to you. And so the identity starts to manifest in your life. Um, rejection is another one. People feel rejected. People struggle sometimes with not belonging. And I know some of you here today feel as though, I just don't feel I belong. Wherever it is you are, I don't seem to feel that I belong. And I want to say, now I'm not saying this is always the case, but I do believe there are some of you here today, it's because there is a spirit oppressing you of rejection. And it's not letting you feel as if you belong. And if you set free of that, you will start to feel the Holy Spirit will give you that feeling of you belong. That prophecy I just gave, I suddenly realized how it's linked now. I'm not going to leave you out. And some of you are feeling as if you're out. Why am I not included? It could be a spirit we're looking at. Grief. Somebody is struggling with grief. And it's a grief that, there's a natural grief. When something happens and there's a loss maybe, you can grieve over that. It may not be a person, it may be a job or something, whatever. But you can grieve over that. It's good to grieve for a certain time. It brings a release. People who don't grieve can struggle all, with all sorts of problems later on down the road. Try to put a stiff upper lip and... You know, there's time just to grieve. But if that grief is going on and on and on, I think it's been there for more than a year or two, something is not right. And there's a spirit of grief that's manifesting grief in your life. And some live with grief all their life. But Jesus has come to set us free. Joy for mourning. Joy for morning. God wants to give you today joy for morning, whoever you are. Let him release you of this. Python. So what do you think a python's going to do? Strike you, then what? Squeeze. What a python does is attach to you, I think it's with its teeth, and then it wraps itself around you and starts to squeeze the life out of you. Yeah? We had a lady come for prayer once. Now, I, I want to give a government health warning here. This is, you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit because you may be struggling with a shortness of breath and it may not be this. But this lady came with a shortness of breath. That was one of her problems. There were other things we were praying into. And suddenly the Lord brought this event to mind. And I knew a spirit of Python did that. And I thought, oh, I wonder if she's ever been involved in fortune telling or the history of it in a family line. And when we asked her the question, she said, oh, yes, I did that. But many years ago. I thought I'd repented of that. I said, yeah, that's fine. That's good you did. But what's come through that experience could still be hooked in. And we need to tell it to go in the name of Jesus. 
So we, she, we led her in a prayer to repent, break her agreement with that fortune telling. And then we prayed for her and prayed that spirit of python to go. We told her it was a python. Um, it sort of freaked her a little, but it, it, it linked with what she was struggling with. And she needed to see that. And when we prayed it off, guess what? She suddenly felt, oh, she felt something has released itself from my lungs and I can breathe properly. Isn't that amazing? And so there can be a manifestation of the identity of it in our lives. And today, some of you are struggling with shortness of breath. Now, you may just have asthma. You may have some other problem. So it may not be you, but the Spirit of God is touching you now and you know you were involved in fortune telling maybe years ago and you may have gone to other things, divination, whatever it is, in the occult, and you know the Spirit of God today is witnessing to you, this is that, and you can be set free. You can breathe the breath of God. You've gone all quiet on me. You're looking all serious. But sometimes we need to address this. And because the atmosphere around her is, is getting more and more occult-based, we've got to deal with this church. We've got to recognize it and deal with it. Because God wants to make church a safe place. Amen. Okay. Let's move on. On verse 17 of this, this spirit says, through this girl, these men, speaking of Paul, Silas, and the team, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Spot on. It's the truth. The enemy knows the truth. And he'll sow that truth to build a bridge in. You know something? The enemy knows who you are. He knows when you're in town about Father's business. And he knows the call of God on your life. I remember I used to go to the Isle of Wight, and one day one lady who was in the co one of the um, covens there, satanic covens, got saved. And she came to one of the meetings, and she shared with me afterwards. She said, you, your name came up quite regularly on our list to pray against you when you came on the island. I thought, oh, <laughs> that sort of freaked me a little, actually. But I realized, no, I'm in Christ. I'm safe, as long as I stay in Christ, within his boundaries. But yeah, he knows when you're in town about Father's business. He's not that bothered about if you're not walking in Father's business. You're not a threat to him. But when you start to say, God, what do you want me to do? We sang that Godfrey Bertel. That's an old one. <laughs> Godfrey Bertel's song. What was it? What was the word? What was this? <laughs> to seek, yeah, to seek God. Yeah, when you seek God and you listen to what God's saying and you start to act upon that, you need Jesus to do all those things for you. <laughs> but he will. But it's when you seek God's face, listen and do what he's telling you to do, that's when you're a threat. And that's when you need him to kick in in those areas. Hallelujah. But he knows who you are. He knows when you're in town about Father's business. And he knows the call of God on your life. He knows truth. And he's going to share it to build a bridge into the work to be seen as a valid source so that people will go to that source. But his desire is to pollute the work and defile it. That's his aim. But he puts on that good shot for, oh, bring in truth. And I've had that happen to me. I've not done it. I've had it happen to me. And it's tempting to grab hold of it. It's interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, he says, you, these are servants. He recognized servants of the Most High God. The word in the Greek for a servant means one devoted to God, in respect to God that is, one devoted to God, given up to his will and his will alone. That's when you're a major threat. When you're devoted to the Lord and you're devoted only to do His will, you're a threat to the enemy. And He knows your servants. And He knows that, that God is the most high God. What does that tell Him? We're on the winning side. There's no other God. Great. He's serving a God that's not as strong as the God that we're serving. 
He's serving Satan. That demon's serving Satan. He's under authority of Satan. But God is greater. And he's on the loose inside. So he doesn't come out with all our attack. He comes with deception. And if he can hook you with deception, then he's won the battle. Because you've stepped outside from under the God Almighty. God is for us. Who can be against us? That word for us is not just something, oh, well, we're his children, he's for us. Hold on. That word in the Greek means to be under God. God, if we're under God, if God's for us, it means he's above us. So if we're submitted to him, we're in a safe place. And that's when we stay in that safe place. Psalm 91, when you stay under the shadow of his wing, you're in a safe place. Amen. You wander outside of that wing, you may get hit. Yep. Now, theology can throw a curve in sometimes and tell you that, you know, you look at Job and you think, well, how did he get hit? Well, sometimes God allows that for us. A re go down that road because we'll get too confused. Well, we won't get some... I don't want to confess that. We won't get confused. <laughs> but anyway, moving on. Not for now. Servants, he's, he's on the loose inside. And if you fall for his deception, you will lose the battle. So we need... We desperately need the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the discerning of spirits, to recognize what's kosher and what's not. We need that gift. Look at how Paul operates in that gift. Verse 18. Now, it's the translation I gave there for that verse is King James. Because King James brings out the word that other scriptures don't, the other translations miss it a bit. It's not wrong, but they just miss it a bit. This word is grieved. It's a powerful word in the Greek. Paul was grieved. This happened after so many days. It kept going on and on. And suddenly Paul was so grieved in his spirit, that's enough. It's God's timing to deal with it. Um, the word grieved means to be greatly pained, troubled, a loss of peace, offended. Okay? How do we know that something's not quite right? You start to lose your peace. You'll get a warning bell going off inside and a pain inside. Oh, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't sit right. You've got to start listening to that and don't think you're judging it. You are getting something from God. Don't judge it as not God because it may be God. And that warning bell inside is telling you, beware. Hmm. I was, when I first went into ministry, I was in Derby, I was setting up a, a, an outreach work, and God used it in amazing ways. You've heard my stories over the years. But one day, just before, just as we were setting it up, this guy walked in off the street, never seen him before. He sat down, he says, God's given me something for you, sir. I thought, ooh, sat down with him, what's God giving you? He says, I'm seeing a movie. I thought, where's that in scripture, movie? <laughs> Rolling vision. And he says, God's saying this and this and this, and I'm seeing this and this. And it was so spot on, it was to the letter what God had called me to do. God had been speaking to me about a year or so beforehand about the call on my life, and he was laying it out. And I thought, wow, this is absolutely amazing. I got so sucked into it. But you know, something was just like ringing in here. Beware, beware. But I thought, oh no, this is so exciting. And I ignored that warning bell. And then suddenly, I'm writing it all down, and suddenly all the lights went out in the building. We were in total darkness. And I don't think that the electricity went out down the road either. It was in our building. And God spoke to me and said, you've just got sucked in by the darkness. And actually the guy walked out and I to repent of that and burn that stuff. You need to listen to that. So important, else you get sucked in. Mm. The Greek word also for being grieved means to be worn out or drained of life. Python. See that? Drained of life. Worn out 
or drained of life. It's not life-giving, but it's squeezing life out of you and your meetings. There are people who operate in this spirit, and they sometimes don't even know it. We were in a meeting once where it started to operate, and when this person shared, it sucked the life out of the meeting. We, she was sharing truth, good doctrine, but it just had a, it, it was a strange effect. And it's like, all oh, the life went out of the meeting. And it's like, we just seem to have to close it down. And that's it. Good night, everybody. And it was strange. And then one day, God started to speak to us and said, Python, deal with it. Now, there came a point when we had to deal with it. But it will squeeze life out of your meeting. Even, have you ever sat under a message where you thought, this is truth, but I feel strange. And you walk out feeling as though it hasn't... Oh, Built me up, it's drained me off. Hopefully that's not going to be today. <laughs> Although I did fortune telling, but I got set free of it all. Interesting. It can come also manifest as a counterfeit word of knowledge. And it be knowledge you think, oh, that's right, but... You go to a spiritualist church, they'll give you knowledge. And it'll be spot on often. How did you know that about my family? Well, it's a familiar spirit. It's been with the family all the years and it knows what to tell you. You're not connecting with the dead. You're connecting with demons. Who know you. And know your family. Um, the Greek also, it's amazing what you find in the Greek word. The Greek word also means to, listen to this, to work at with great labor or to manage with pain, which suggests it's over a period of time. Now, that's interesting here, I think, because it's over a period of time. Verse 18 of the passage we just read, she did this many days. It was over a period of time, but Paul didn't <coughs> deal with it immediately. Do you notice that? You know, suddenly there's a manifestation of this and he's thinking, this is not quite right, but he allows it to go on for a few days or many days, it says. Why delay? Surely if you see it, why not just deal with it? We've been in meetings where there's been the manifestation. We thought, that's not God. That's not God. Sounds true, but it's not God. And God said, don't deal with it. And you know, sometimes the, the, the flock needs to see it. You deal with it, they don't know it's there. But it's like, let it manifest. And the person who, sometimes the person who's being used that way doesn't know it. They just love the Lord and want to serve the Lord, but they don't know that this thing's attached and it's, it's an extreme. And sometimes there needs to be a time when we just let it be exposed so people see it. And actually when they get set free, they'll see the difference. You know, because some people have said to us, oh, that's just them. They've just got a quirky nature. They do, well, it, 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 it's, it's John. John's always like that. Well, John might always be like that, but John might also have a problem that needs getting set free of. And we need to see the spiritual dimension, not just the quirky character. Oh, we don't get on with each other because we just have different natures. Hmm. That can be the case. I don't want to knock that. But I, I, I've been around Christendom too long to recognize it's just quirky natures. It's also, we have, the spiritual antennas start going bing, 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 bing. There's something going on here that needs dealing with. And that then can be unity. Because this, any spirit is looking to divide us. And church splits have happened often because we haven't dealt with this stuff. Because he's out there to break up the church. Because our witnesses, look how lo they love each other. Mm. So we need to recognize this. Um, eventually, he deals with it. There comes a time when the Holy Spirit says, now is the time. Paul recognizes that time. Prayer has stirred up the spiritual dimension. Darkness manifests, and now it's time. It demands an action. Why deliver it? Why deliver her from it? Well... He doesn't want people going to that source. Simple reason. There's power in the name of Jesus. I'm going to wind this up. Power in the name of Jesus. 
to deliver when it's God's timing. That's important you add that. There's power in the name of Jesus to deliver when it's God's timing. God's timing, it's going to work. The name of Jesus is not a formula, but it's an authority when you're under his authority. Okay? And you're in sync with heaven. We have the keys of the kingdom to bind on earth and release on earth what we've seen in heaven. So it's out of intimacy, not formula. Yeah. We're not just applying the name of Jesus here, there, and everywhere. Because it ain't going to work. Or well, the way you want it to work, anyway. And he commands it to go. He doesn't say, Jesus, will you do it? <laughs> Jesus says, no, you do it. And he's saying to us this morning, you do it. Yeah. Don't expect the experts to do it. These things will follow those who believe in me and follow me. Not the experts, just those who believe in me and follow me. I mean, it may not be a main ministry, but when it appears, God may be saying, deal with it. And watch the, watch the power you have in his name when you're under his authority. Yeah. Don't shirk your responsibility. In fact, we are, our responsibility to the Great Commission, is, this is part of it. Mark tells us it. It's your, part, it's your Great Commission, not just to share good news. Praise God you share good news, but there may be, response, there may be reaction to good news and you need to also deal with that. When you relinquish your responsibility, you relinquish your authority. And you quench the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit moving in our midst, don't we? We don't want to quench anything. So if God's telling you to do anything, not just this, but anything, do it, else you quench the Holy Spirit. And you can stop it flowing for others around you. Say yes to the Lord. Embrace it. The con just let me just address the consequences, finally. Paul and Silas, what are the consequences when they take this action? The people got upset. They didn't like them anymore. They wrongly accused them. Don't you just love upsetting people? Now, I know some Christians do. <laughs> and you run a mile from them. But generally, I don't want to upset people. And I don't want you to think badly of me. You don't think badly of me, do you? There wasn't a few amens there. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I tell myself. But I'm not going to draw back from doing what God's told me to do, despite the consequences, if it's at the expense of displeasing God. I might not please you. I'd like to please you. But I might not please you. I might look bad in your eyes. But if I look good in God's eyes at the end of it, that's what's important. Above all, I want to hear at the end of the day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is linked to eternal. If you look at the context of that scripture, the joy of the Lord is eternal. There's no substitute for the joy of the Lord because it's my strength. Amen. Amen. I want the joy of the Lord. I want to be happy when I walk away, even if you're unhappy with me. It has no substitute and it counts for eternity. You can have the honour, the praise and the reward of man. But that's all you've got. You'll have nothing after it. And it all gets burnt up. And it's fleeting. Have you noticed? Hosanna! Hosanna! Our king has come to set us free from the Roman Empire. Hosanna! Hosanna! Whoops! It, he's let them take him and they're going to crucify him. Crucify him! Crucify him! He's not going to go to our agenda. And when people don't want uh, uh, see you not going to, according to their agenda, they start to turn on you. Yep. It's fleeting, yep. the honour that men gives. You don't want it. You don't want it. Fear a man. When you fear man, you stop serving God. And you serve your enemy. You serve God's enemy. And that's why you grieve the Holy Spirit when you fear man, because you're worshipping another. 
you grieve. Not just quench, but you grieve. You hurt the heart of God. Because it's like he's married to you and you've just gone with another woman. No, it's the other way around. You know what I mean? It's adultery. That's what grieves him. Don't do it. Finally, Paul and Silas, we're going to look at this next time. Actually, just for to say this, I'm just looking at my notes to see where I should finish here. Drawing back from this ministry creates an unsafe place. It robs you of your anointing and kingdom growth through you. But Paul and Silas do what the Holy Spirit's telling them to do, and suddenly it opens a, a powerful door to kingdom growth. That I think they thought was probably unexpected and brought great stretching. It stretched them beyond their comfort zone. They went into prison, actually. But we'll look at that next time. And I'm, I want to challenge you for 2024. God is wanting to stretch us beyond our comfort zone. Yep. But it may not feel comfortable. Are you willing? But God will grow the kingdom through you in a powerful way. So there's a cost. You see, he said, take up your cross, not your cushion. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Okay. If you're willing to be stretched for 2024, despite whatever, if it takes me beyond my comfort zones, I'm willing to do it. I suggest you go home, you get alone with God, take, get a moment when you can be alone with God and just say, God, I'm ready. And watch what he does. I want to leave that with you. But this morning, God is going to set people free of strongholds that you've been battling. And he doesn't want you to battle with them anymore. And at the end of this service, I'm going to encourage those who are on the prayer ministry team um, and link to that. Will you be available at the front? Because I'm going to encourage you to come forward. You may be struggling with grief. You may be struggling with fear. You may be struggling with that tightness of chest and breath, as if your breath's been squeezed, squeezed out of it. And you know this morning it's linked to fortune telling um, that's a rejection and just uncleanness and if that's you don't go without getting set free it's a simple prayer and you can go from this place released in Jesus name Father I pray your Holy Spirit will start to touch hearts even now and they will know I need that prayer and I'm ready to be freed by you. Lord, I pray you'll give that witness to your people. And Lord, we pray that will you manifest that gift especially to us in our day, that gift of discernment to recognize what's kosher and what's not, that we may walk in a safe place and not be robbed. And give us the boldness to deal with it when it comes up into our space and on our radar. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.